Putin bad news. Peace mediation in Ukraine. A pipe dream for the global south. There is a chance that Vladimir Putin has managed to annoy too many powerful countries at the G20 summit. One of the more enduring myths about the Russo-Ukrainian conflict is that Russia has prevented the global south from giving Ukraine the support it might have otherwise received through a combination of information and diplomatic campaigns. Many countries in the Southern Hemisphere have refused to cooperate with Western sanctions and have abstained from key votes at the United Nations, despite the fact that they have never actively supported Russia or endorsed its aggression. The reasons for this have less to do with apathy toward Ukraine and more to do with historical ties to Russia and irritation with the West. For instance, the current government of South Africa, the African National Congress, remembers the help they received from the Soviet Union during their fight against apartheid. Russia has been a reliable strategic ally for India and a supplier of cutting-edge weapons. Before the full-scale invasion, China and Russia developed a friendship without limits, as it was praised at the time. While the West has been called out for its focus on Ukraine, it has been accused of paying less attention to the humanitarian catastrophes caused by ongoing wars in Africa and the Middle East. Many of the more autocratic governments in this group were unimpressed by the Biden administration's framing of the conflict as one between democracy and autocracy in the war's early stages. Finally, they see the United States and its allies, most notably the United Kingdom, as hypocritical for talking up a rules-based international order, while their actions in Iraq, Libya, and elsewhere show the opposite. Over the course of this year, however, this story has taken on more nuance. The Biden administration and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky have worked to strengthen ties with both Russia and China, contributing to this development. The Russian government's intransigence and complete lack of realism on potential peace settlement groundwork is a major source of frustration. Food and energy prices have been negatively affected by Russia's actions. Due to these factors, these nations are finding it increasingly difficult to maintain a neutral stance and they are beginning to take diplomatic initiatives on their own. Russia may find it more difficult to oppose these than Western-backed initiatives. The term, Global South, is useful because it allows us to continue discussing international relations without having to repeatedly name each individual country. The label can quickly become deceptive if it is taken too seriously, as if it represents a unified group with a common goal. This is the most recent example of classifying nations by what they are not rather than by their identities. Those who chose to remain neutral during the Cold War formed what was known as the Non-Aligned Movement. Together with other countries that had chosen neutrality, like Sweden and Switzerland, they became known as the Neutral and Non-Aligned. Since they were neither a part of the first capitalist world nor the second communist world, the many developing countries that fell outside the main blocks were grouped together as the third world. These classifications no longer served a purpose after the Cold War ended because they failed to adequately reflect the complexity and independence of these nations. It also became clear that the relative economic stagnation of many of these countries relative to the West was not the only noteworthy aspect of this new era. They were not only catching up to the West but also sharing some values that set them apart. The BRICS grouping of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa represents the most consequential of these nations. They included many of the world's most populous nations, which contributed to their rising economic importance. As with the previous grouping, this one began as a shorthand but developed into a genuine political entity complete with summits. They are unanimous in their criticism of U.S. hegemony and support for increased global diversity of power. They are against the dollarization of the global economy and the frequent use of economic sanctions by the United States. Despite their similarities, countries like populous Indonesia and wealthy Saudi Arabia are not included in the BRICS group. Internal discussions about whether to expand membership have begun. NATO and the European Union are two Western institutions that have expanded since the Cold War's end and which offer a level of integration that is lacking in other regional institutions, such as ASEAN and Mercosur. The seven most industrialized nations, the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, get together once a year, 
always with the European Union and often with other invited friends and relatives. It used to be the G8, but Russia was kicked out after its annexation of Crimea in 2014. This meant that there was one fewer forum for diplomatic talks between Russia and the West. Because of Russia's veto, the obvious venue, the United Nations Security Council, has been paralyzed. Aside from the G7 and BRICS, there is another organization that is sizable enough to convene the world's leading powers and is more open-minded in its approach to international cooperation. The Group of 20, G20, was established in 1999 in response to a financial crisis, but it has since expanded its focus. Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, Japan, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea, Turkey, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union are all part of it. They do this once a year as well. The previous summit was held in Indonesia, and the upcoming one will be held in India in September. Therefore, it is not as simple as the West versus the rest, or as if only the five permanent members of the UN Security Council matter. As nations figure out their responses to the Russo-Ukrainian conflict, the complexity of the ever-changing international system has become more apparent. Foreign critics of Western support for Ukraine often voiced the same concerns as their Western counterparts, that too much effort is being put into stoking the fires of war by sending arms to Ukraine, and not enough into diplomacy to end the war. People keep hoping that through dialogue, they can figure out a reasonable solution to the problem. People who want to sound progressive while supporting a vicious, nationalist aggressor state have been drawn to this line, as have realists, who assume Ukraine will have to cede territory to Russia at some point. This camp also typically assumes that Washington can pressure Kyiv into submission in order to seal a deal. It was never likely that this would work out. Joe Biden would look bad if he tried to pressure Ukraine into a one-sided treaty that Russia is unlikely to uphold. This would also cause friction within the alliance. Moreover, those who are advocating for active negotiations have received no encouragement from Vladimir Putin. At the outset of hostilities, the two sides discussed the possibility of a peace agreement, attempting to find common ground on the Donbass, Crimea, and neutrality. That was impossible to achieve, and the Ukrainian position hardened as news of Russian atrocities spread and troops fled the area around Kyiv. Putin now wants Ukraine to permanently cede territory that Russia has claimed for itself, which is more territory than Russia actually occupies. That's not going to develop that way. As a result, the Western peace camp is on the decline. The most committed advocates argue that we must get ready for the ripe time, which they admit is not yet and requires a shift in mentality in Kiev and Moscow. Consensus from the Western world mirrors Ukraine's position. The Russian government's actions and stated goals preclude any possibility of productive negotiations. Helping Ukraine with its military operations is the most important priority because only proof that Russia is losing the war will change its mind. As a result, many non-Western countries have stepped up to play the role of peacemaker to fill the void left by the West. When China made its own proposals in February, the ball really started rolling. These were met with skepticism due to Xi Jinping's no limits, partnership with Putin and the accompanying anti-NATO rhetoric. But Zelensky saw right away that, at first glance, they favored Ukraine over Russia. Taking over the territory of a neighboring state and bombing its cities goes against the core principles of acting in accordance with the UN Charter and respecting national sovereignty, territorial integrity, and international humanitarian law. Later, Xi and Zelensky had a conversation, and the two countries' ties grew closer. Other countries, including those in Africa and most recently Saudi Arabia, have also taken the initiative. Brazil's effort was the last of its kind. It has condemned the Russian invasion but has not backed sanctions against Russia or provided arms to Ukraine. As a result of his warm reception of the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Brasilia and his objection to Western arms deliveries as prolonging the war, President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva came under intense scrutiny. 
After Putin invited him to Russia, he declined but reiterated Brazil's willingness, together with India, Indonesia, and China, to talk to both sides of the conflict in search of peace. But he has avoided Zelensky's direct approach, and he now appears disillusioned. Lula came to the conclusion that neither Putin nor Zelensky were since his initiative had little success.